Hello, I'm here today with Erin Baker, who is a 2014 graduate of the Institute for Advanced Analytics, Master Science and Analytics program. And Erin, um, why don't you get us started today by just telling us a little bit about yourself and your trajectory? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so as uh, Valerie said, I uh, was a graduate in the class of 2014. Um, my undergraduate prior to the IA was industrial engineering. So one of those folks. Uh, I originally had thought uh, that I would continue in the industrial engineering world, but as I left the IA, I actually had the opportunity to go to Lowe's Home Improvement um, to do customer analytics, which was not something that I had ever thought that I'd be interested in, but uh, the opportunity was there, so I, I went with it. Uh, and I did that for two years, and then I went on to work at Lowe's.com. Um, I managed a team of data scientists doing the product recommendations um, and personalization on the website. I loved that job, but um, personal life brought me back to Raleigh. So uh, I took a leap of faith, and I came back to Raleigh before having a new job absolutely lined up. And I actually ended up working for a smaller kind of consulting firm called Brooks Bell. Uh, and that was a great experience. It kind of gave you that opportunity to uh, work in a smaller startup -y type culture, but it wasn't, uh, but it was just established enough to feel kind of safe um, and feel like there was an opportunity to both learn um, from people who were established there, but then also uh, kind of leave my own mark on it. So I did that for two years. And after that, I was, uh, I had the opportunity to join uh, Disney remotely uh, on the Disney media side, specifically, I worked for ABC. Uh, and ever since then, I've been just here at Disney working um, kind of originally as a principal data scientist with a small team of uh, data scientists. And then over the two and a half years here, I've been just kind of growing the team. And uh, now I'm a senior manager and I lead a team of currently eight data scientists uh, with the expect expectation to keep growing. So really exciting space to be in in the, in the kind of television media space. That's excellent. Thank you for that. So. Okay, you've described a little bit about what you do at Disney, but what does your actual day to day look like? Like, what does a manager of a team of data scientists actually do from sure. one day to the next? Yeah, uh, <laughs> some people might find this really boring, but I'd say probably my typical day is sit in meetings um, back to back. So, a typical day for me probably starts at about nine o'clock by I'd say 11, maybe 10. I'm on calls and I typically am on calls until five or six o'clock at night. Um, now what those calls are, all those back-to-backs, a lot of it is project updates and status meetings with the various projects that are going on on my team. So typically one data scientist will work on maybe two to three projects at one time. Um, so having a team of eight, I'm kind of constantly flowing through just different project updates where things are. Um, and a lot of what I spend my time doing is really just helping troubleshoot and hypothesize where to take things next. So trying to understand, you know, you start off with some project statement, um, or sometimes we have to define a project statement, but then a lot of it is just trying to, uh, where we hypothesized or what we thought we would do maybe doesn't always meet reality once you start doing it. So there's a lot of just, uh, trying to understand where we can take something, where we can move it, uh, you know, is it still aligned to the business objectives, that kind of stuff. So a lot of my meetings are just meetings with my team to uh, keep projects moving forward. And then the other part of it is meeting with stakeholders. So making sure that the things that we're doing um, are aligned to the questions that they're asking or the questions that they might be asking in the future. Excellent. Yeah, I think um, that's one thing we've alumni over the years is that oftentimes this the soft skills, things like project management and communication end up becoming some of the primary skills they employ in their day-to-day. Yes. Day -day. So, yep, yeah, absolutely. And there are certainly days when I, you know, I get to have my hands on the keyboard and really code. And, and I thoroughly enjoy those days when they exist now. Every once in a while, I tell my boss, I'm like, oh, just to be able to be back to coding would be so great for a week. But, <laughs> I'm curious, so when you were a student in the MSA program, you served as a practicum team lead uh, for a project that was sponsored, I think, by Eastman Chemical, am I correct? Yes. So, you know, that was a, a, a leadership role for somebody who, you know, had come straight out of undergrad, you know, straight into the, the master's program. How did that experience as a team lead inform the way you've approached leadership roles since the MSA? 
Yeah, I, I think in a lot of different ways, but the, the way that stands out to me the most and one of the things that I learned really quickly as a practicum lead is I think you, you start off with this expectation that everybody can do everything and they can all do it equally well. And I think the reality of teams is everybody brings their strengths and weaknesses to a team. Um, and I think it's a lot of the responsibility of a team leader to be able to assess, you know, where those strengths and where those, I don't want to call them weaknesses, but like where there's opportunities for those additional, uh, that additional growth. And so I think, a, you know, a big challenge in the practicum was trying to balance what do people want to learn and where do they want to grow with getting the project accomplished and done. In reality, that's how the working world works as well. You have your team members who are really strong in a certain area, and then you have uh, team members who are stronger in other areas. And it's that combination of bringing those strengths together to get the work done. But at the same time, everybody wants to learn something new. Nobody just wants to keep doing the same thing that they're already strong at. So it's also finding those stretch opportunities to say, okay, I know this person wants to stretch in this particular area. How can I let them do that in such a way that it doesn't risk a particular project or a particular deliverable? So I think that's kind of just this, it's something I learned and it, I saw firsthand as a practicum lead uh, in school. And then it's just one of those things I just had to refine and keep refining. I don't want to say I'm perfect at it by any means, but um, you know, it's just something I think about a lot is where are people strong? How do, how do they bring those strengths to a project? But then where can I help them grow throughout this project as well? I'm going to ask a question that is sort of off the cuff. Where would you say you feel like you still have the most room for growth personally as a, as a professional in the data science space? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, um, I, to be totally candid, I think the independence of leadership is something that I really have a, a place to continue to grow. And what I mean is when you become a leader, um, you have to understand what your permission space is and what your permission space isn't, but nobody really clearly defines for you what that is. So I think um, somebody like me who came from an engineering background always had a very clear cut, this is your objective. And as an engineer, I, I had the tools to be able to take those or take those tools and go solve that particular problem. When you become a leader, it's more about defining what that objective is and defining um, what your problem or what your team is going to solve. And I think for me, uh, understanding where, how far I'm allowed to make those decisions versus not is just something that you just have to be comfortable. When you're really early on in your leadership, you're very timid. You're like, oh, you know, I don't want to step on any toes. I don't want to get in trouble for making decisions. But then over time, you learn that's what your leadership is looking for you to do. And it only kind of increases as you get higher and higher up, right? There's not somebody always telling you what your objective is. You have to define that objective. That's awesome. And, you know, you, you have all of that experience to draw from, and you've now served as a guest lecturer at the Institute for a few years. So how did that come about that you began guest lecturing? And what do you enjoy about engaging with students in that capacity? Yeah, I, you know, lots of things in my career have been um, a desire mixed with a little bit of opportunistic luck. And when I had come back to Raleigh uh, after I'd left Lowe's, I decided, or, you know, I had been interested in re-engaging with the Institute in some way, but I didn't really know what that looked like. Um, I thought maybe I could volunteer in some way. But uh, when I went to work at Brooks, the guy who had brought me in, his name is uh, Reed Bryant, who has also guest lectured at the Institute over the years. Uh, I was just talking to him and I, you know, I was like, well, you know, I'd just really be interested in going back to the Institute and uh, helping the students in some way, but I don't know what that looks like. And he was already teaching a kind of short introduction to digital analytics and was like, hey, I'm doing this in three months. Do you just want to join me? I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. Why not? Um, so that was really the way that I got into it. And it just evolved over time and speaking with Laura and, and saying, you know, hey, these are some other skills that I have that I would feel comfortable teaching. Are there gaps where you feel like um, I could come in and teach this? And that it just evolved organically from there. Uh, and it's really been a great opportunity, I would say. Uh, you know, I'm very thankful to Laura, to Reed, to the entire staff for just giving me the opportunity to continue to teach. I, I love it. Um, it's one of the things that I really look forward to every year. So hopefully we get to keep doing it. Well, it's, it's great to hear that. We love the fact that you do it. So, <laughs> yeah. 
All right, um, I've got a few quick lightning round questions for you, just just real fast. So, okay. um, first one is, what is your preferred coding language? I would have to say R is my preferred language because it, because it's something that I've been teaching for a couple of years. It's really become second uh, nature. And when you're in my kind of role and you just need to get something done, you just go to whatever your second nature is. Uh, so I really like that. I would say my other one, if I had to pick, but it's probably the less popular answer, I would say SQL. Um, I'm a big believer that SQL was the language that got me on this path to begin with um, when I was in engineering. And it's just something that I see used every single day. Every single one of my data scientists use it. It's the way that you interact with data in a corporate environment. So I just think it's a really, really critical skill to know as well. Excellent. All right, you work for Disney. What's your favorite Disney movie, I have to ask? Uh, I would say Tangled. It's gotta be my favorite. Um, if you're familiar with Tangled, Maximus and Flynn, the, uh, the horse and then the, kind of the main character as they're, uh, when they have the sword fighting scene with the frying pan, it's probably like one of my all time favorite uh, scenes. So I'd say we probably watch it, I don't know, three to four times a year. Anytime there's like a Saturday night where we don't know what we want to watch, like I have it on my, it's on the uh, media console. So I'm just like, we could watch Tangled. And, and my partner <laughs> always says, he's like, we just watched Tangled. I'm like, but we could watch it again. <laughs> We all have a handful of those go-tos. Yep. <laughs> all right, last one. What is your favorite thing about Raleigh? Yeah, um, I would say one would probably be like the family. That's really the reason that we moved back here. Uh, my partner's family is from Raleigh. So being close to them, um, his younger sister lives with us while she's in school. So it's just great getting to be here and getting to be involved with her as she's, um, you know, growing into adulthood as well. But I would say outside of just the family reasons for being here, I, one of the big draws to me is the Institute. Um, I think it's one of the reasons that, you know, if I was to look elsewhere, I, I would think, you know, no, I like, I like this opportunity to keep teaching and be involved with the, with the Institute. Um, so that's one of the great things about being here is there's great jobs in Raleigh, but then there's also great connections. There's a great uh, uh, student base and then family is just the cherry on top. Excellent. Well, Aaron, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I really appreciate all of your, just your insights and your thoughts today. So um, thanks for being with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for inviting me to do this.